It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. For today's episode of Comparative Mythology, we're gonna compare and contrast the story of David and Goliath from the Iliad to the Bible. And you guys are probably thinking to yourself, well, geez, Tyler, what is the absolute point of this comparison? How could the Iliad and the Bible be connected? Throughout the whole entire video, I'll try to demonstrate various kind of tropes that are very similar when it comes down to this particular story. Now, the books of Samuel's, the book of Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and First and Second Kings, actually came out roughly around 550 BCE, give or take, during the Babylonian exile. Now, the Britannica articles continue to say that there are various parallels, repetitions, and disparities within the book of Samuel's, that there are different accounts that are given about the origins of the monarchy, that there are two accounts of the rejection of Saul as king, and that there are two other accounts of David's introduction to Saul, and so much more. Now there's an article that goes into great details about the origins about the Iliad and the Odyssey and the Homeric traditions. And the title of the article says, author says, a whole culture, not a single Homer wrote Iliad or the Odyssey. Today we have an author exception. We want to know the biography all the time, but Homer has no biography. The Iliad and the Odyssey are like Viking longships. No one knows who made them. No names attached to them. There's no written designs or drawings. There's simply the evolved beauty of long and careful traditions. There are even doubts about when they were composed. The usual date is roughly around 800 BCE. You believe the tradition began much earlier than that, make your case. My claim is that the poem, especially the Iliad, have their beginnings around 2000 BCE, roughly 1000 or 1200 years earlier than most people say Homer existed. Whatever the case may be, whether there were many Homers or like one Homer or just a single tradition, we do know that the Iliad actually predates the book of Samuel in terms of the dating. So what exactly does it have when it comes down to this particular issue about David and Goliath? Let's listen to the audiobook and just react to the audiobook after we're done listening to it. Hector now sallied forth from the gates and his brother Alexandros with him, both full of ardor for the battle. The sight of them was as welcome to the Trojan host as a fair wind when God is pleased to send it for sailors who are weary and worn out with rowing over the sea. Then Alexandros killed Menestheus, whose father was Ereuthoos, the bludgeon man, and his father Philomedusa. His home was in Arne. Hector struck Iunios on the neck under the helmet and brought him down. Glaucus the Lycian ran his spear through the shoulder of Iphinous Dexiades. As he was mounting his chariot, he fell to the ground and moved no more. But when Athena saw her friends falling thus, she shot down from Olympus. Apollo saw her come and issued out of the citadel to help his Trojans. The two met by the oak tree, and Apollo called out, Why are you here again, you daughter of Zeus, in all this excitement? Why has your hot temper brought you from Olympus? Do you want to turn the battle and give the victory to your Danians? You have no pity when Trojans fall. But listen to me, and I will tell you what is best to do. Let us put a stop to fighting for this day. Afterwards they shall fight again, until they make an end of Ilios. For I see you goddesses mean to destroy this city. Athena replied, So be it, Shutafar. That was just what I had in mind myself in coming here. Very well, how do you think to stop it? Apollo said, let us move Hector to challenge all comers to single combat. Then the Achaeans will be put on their mettle and send someone to fight Hector. Athena consented, and at once their compact became plain to the mind of Helenos, Priam's son, the diviner. So he said to Hector, My dear prince, you know a good notion as well as Zeus could himself. Would you listen to me for a moment? I am your brother, you know. Go out yourself, 
and challenge all comers to single combat, and let both armies sit down and look on. For it is not your fate to die now, the voice of the immortal gods has told me so. Hector was delighted when he heard these words. He marched between the armies, holding his spear by the middle of the shaft, and kept back his own battalions. They all sat down, and then Agamemnon made his men do the like. Apollo and Athena, in the form of two vultures, perched upon the tall oak tree and looked on with great enjoyment. The ranks were set close and bristled with shields and helmets and spears, as the waves of the sea ripple and crinkle when the west wind blows it black. Then... Hector addressed them all. Hear me speak, Trojans and Achaeans both, and let me tell you what is in my mind. Cronides, throned on high, would not let us keep our sworn treaty, but he ordains a hard struggle for us all until either you shall take the castle of Troy or you shall be vanquished yourselves beside your own ships. Here among you are the greatest men of all the Achaean peoples. Now then, if any one of you has a mind to fight with me, let him come forth and be your champion against Hector. Here is what I propose, and let Zeus be witness on both parts. If that man shall strike me down, let him strip me and take my armor for his spoil. But my body he shall give back to be carried home, that my people may give me dead my portion of fire." But if Apollo grant me success and I strike him down, I will strip off his armor and take it into sacred Troy and hang it before the temple of Apollo Shutafar. But the body I will give back, that his friends may carry it to their camp, to give him funeral and build him a barrow beside the broad Hellespont. Then men will say in far distant generations to come as they sail along the shore, Yonder is the barrow of a man dead long ago, a champion whom famous Hector slew. So my fame will never be forgotten. Silence fell upon all. They were ashamed to refuse, and they feared to accept. But at last Menelaus rose to his feet and cried out loudly in anger and contempt, "'Oh, you boasters, you women! I cannot call you men! Here is a stain upon us, a terrible terror of a stain, if not a man will go out to meet Hector. May you all rot into mud and water where you sit, weak and inglorious. I will arm me against this man myself.' but the cords of victory are held above by the immortal gods. Then he put on his armor, and then, Menelaus, the end of your life would have come, for Hector was far stronger, had not the Achaean princes sprung up and laid hold of you. King Agamemnon himself caught his brother by the right hand and cried, You are mad, Menelaus, and what is the use of madness like that? Hold back, however hard it is, and don't fight a better man than yourself just for a challenge. Everyone dreads Hector Priamides. Even Achilles shudders to meet this man in battle, and he is a much better man than you. Just sit down among your friends, and they will put up another champion for this man. Even if he is fearless and a glutton for a fight, I vow he will be glad to rest his knees if he gets clear out of this battle." He succeeded in changing his brother's mind, for what he said was true, and the servants took off his armor. Then Nestor rose and spoke. Look there now, what tribulation has come upon our country and our people. It would make Peleus groan aloud, poor old man. Ah, what a wise man he was, what a good king. I remember well how he enjoyed asking me all about the great men of our people, who were their fathers and who were their sons. If he could hear about them now, all trembling before Hector, how he would lift up his hands to heaven and pray that his soul might leave his body and go down to Hades. O oh, Father Zeus, Athena, Apollo, if I were young and strong now, as I was, when Pelions and Arcadians gathered and fought beside the swift river of Celadon before the walls of Phaea, about the stream of Iardanos, on the other side stood their champion, Ereuthalion, a grand fellow he was, and he wore the armor of King Ariithous, the glorious Ariithous, a name of note among men and women. 
They called him the Bludgeon Man, because he fought not with bow or spear, but with an iron bludgeon, which broke up the battalions. Lycurgos killed him. He trusted to skill, not to force, and killed him in a narrow lane where his bludgeon could not save his life. Lycurgos got in first and ran him through the middle with his spear, and down he came on his back. The victor took his arms, which were the gift of Ares. After that, Lycurgus wore them himself in battle. But when he grew old, he gave them to Eruthalion, his faithful squire, and Eruthalion, wearing these, challenged all the best. They were all trembling and affrighted, not a man would dare. But my daring mind, in its boldness, set me on to fight him, although I was youngest of them all, and fight him I did, and Athena gave me the victory. That was the biggest and strongest man I ever killed. He covered a great space, sprawling all abroad. If I were only young now as I was then. As you guys can hear from the audiobook, Hector wants to fight the most strongest man, and the strongest man happened to be Ostelian, and it turns out that he cannot necessarily really fight against that giant, while Nestor managed to take the whole entire giant down out of sheer luck. Now, obviously, the main difference here is that the setting is much more polytheistic because back then, of course, the Greeks worshipped many different gods and that Zeus was actually the chief god and there are many other gods within this sort of Greek pantheon. But otherwise, it seems as though that the core message of, of course, somebody fighting a giant is actually there in that story. So what exactly happens for the case of David and Goliath? Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by David his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Chapter 17 Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah in Ephesdamim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah, and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had an helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed six hundred shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. And the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next unto him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening, and presented himself forty days. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn, and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand, 
and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. Now Saul and they, and all the men of Israel, were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning, and left the sheep with a keeper, and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench, as the host was going forth to the fight, and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage, and ran into the army, and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled before him, and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another, and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put an helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff in his hand, and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag which he had even in a scrip, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air, and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass, when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag, and took thence a stone, and slang it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him. 
but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Shearaim, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. So the question then becomes, how is it that these two stories are just so incredibly similar? Like, what's the history on why they are so similar? For more information, let's go to Britannica to know more about the issue of the Philistines. The Philistines expanded into neighboring areas and soon came into conflict with the Israelites, a struggle represented by the Samson Saga and the Hebrew Bible. Possessing superior arms and military organizations, the Philistines were able, in 1050 BCE, to occupy part of the Judean hill country. They were finally defeated by Israelite King David 10th century and thereafter their history was that of individual cities rather than of a people. After the division of Judea and Israel 10th century, the Philistines regained their independence and often engaged in border battles with those kingdoms. Now my personal speculation based upon this historical data is that because the Philistines were of Greek origin, that will mean that the Israelites will have contact with Greek ideas, and because they have direct contact with Greek ideas, that will mean that they might actually probably borrow have some sort of direct influence from those ideas from the Greek societies onto their personal stories about David and Goliath. But uh, what do you guys think about this comparison? Tell me in the comments section down below. And as always, I'll see you guys in the next video. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare, as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.